Greetings, and welcome to Etzheim's weekly podcast, recorded live in Richardson, Texas. We invite you now to join us for one of our synagogue's Shabbat messages. All right. Well, Shabbat Shalom. We're continuing our series in 1 Peter. Today is part four. We're going to look today at the uh, problem of evil and suffering in the world. So turn with me to 1 Peter 1, beginning in verse 3. And, and Peter writes, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Yeshua the Messiah from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish or spoil or fade. This inheritance is it's kept for you in heaven, who through faith you're shielded by God's power into the coming of the salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. In all of this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you've had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, your faith may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Yeshua the Messiah is revealed. Though you've not seen him, you love him. Even though you don't see him now, you believe in him, and you're filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. Why? Because you're receiving the end result of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets, who spoke of the grace that was to come, to come to you, searched intently uh, and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and the circumstances to which the spirit of Messiah within them was pointing when he preached the sufferings of Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, uh, when they spoke of these things that have now been told to you uh, by those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even the angels long to look into these things. Hallelujah. This passage uh, raises uh, the issue of what the theologians call theodicy. Uh, which is the problem of, of evil and suffering uh, in the world. You know, a popular argument against God, or the God of the Bible, goes something like this. We'll put it on the overhead. Uh, uh, if God allows evil and suffering to continue because he can't stop it, then he might be good, but he's not all-powerful. But if God could stop evil and suffering, but allows it to continue anyway, then he might be all-powerful, but he's not good. I, either way, the good, all-powerful God of the Bible can't exist. Now, that's a pretty formidable argument on the overhead. How do we respond to this? This text tells us, number one, one way not to respond. Number two, three ways uh, to face evil and suffering in this world. And number three, what to look for for our hope. Now, the context here is that Peter is addressing people who've been suffering a great deal, and they're going to suffer even more. Uh, and when we experience horrendous suffering and catastrophe, like what's happened in Israel October 7th of last year, one way people to respond is to abandon their belief in God. But notice what Peter says. Look at 1 Peter 1, verse 6. You had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials so that your faith may result in praise, glory, and honor. Peter says the pain and suffering you're going through now doesn't have to weaken your faith at all. It can strengthen your faith. Peter's saying in the face of evil and suffering, abandoning your belief in God doesn't help at all. It doesn't help anything. It doesn't help you understand your suffering. It doesn't help you handle your suffering. Abandoning your belief in God does not help at all. Martin Luther King Jr., in his famous letter from the Birmingham jail, uh, he says that the only way to know if a human law is, is unjust is if there's a divine law, a higher law from God. He says, you know, if there is no God, if there is no divine higher law, there's no way to know whether a particular human law was just or unjust. You see, if there is no God, someone could say, oh, oh that law's unjust, but that would only be so according to their standards. And why should their standards be privileged over anyone else's? And if there, if there is no God, and therefore no higher divine law, 
then how can you say any particular historical event is unjust? Uh, if, if there's nothing but nature, if nature is all there is, there's nothing more natural than violence. According to evolution, that's how you and I got here. Natural selection, survival of the fittest, the strong eat the weak. So if there's no God and all we have is nature, what's wrong with violence? It's perfectly natural. Jean-Paul Sartre, in his famous essay on existentialism on the overhead, uh, he writes this, if God doesn't exist, there's no longer any possibility of an a priori good existing. Uh, it's nowhere written that one has to be honest or, or mustn't lie, uh, since we're now on a plane where there's only human beings. Dostoevsky once wrote, if God doesn't exist, everything is possible. Everything's permitted. That's right. If God doesn't exist, we have neither behind us or before us a luminous realm of values, nor any means of justification of any behavior whatsoever. So what Sartre is saying here is if, if there's no God, then you might have feelings that this is wrong, this is unjust, but that's just your personal feelings. That's all. If there's no God, on what possible basis could you object that the natural order of violence is unnatural? You see, if you don't believe in God, suffering and evil are as big of a problem, if not a bigger problem, than if you do. Now, if you're struggling with how a good God could allow evil and suffering, this is not merely a philosophical issue. But the first point is simply this. Evil and suffering is a problem for those who believe in God, yes. But it's an equally, if not greater, problem for those who don't believe in God. In fact, it's an even bigger problem for those who don't believe in God. For if there's no God, who's even to say that this or that is wrong or is unjust? On what basis do you even ask for a better world? So getting rid of your belief in God in order to handle or understand evil and suffering doesn't help. The overhead. Okay, what will? Here are four ways, according to Peter, you can face evil and suffering in your life. You have to, one, look back to something. Number two, you have to avoid pat answers. Number three, you have to embrace not knowing why you suffer. And number four, you have to build your life on God based on the proof of his love. So first, you have to look back to something. Now notice how Peter likens suffering and pain and trouble to a fire. He likens it to a furnace that refines gold in it. Now that's a very powerful image. Uh, the troubles and sufferings are like a fire, uh, a fiery furnace that you put metals through. And as we mentioned, if you were here a few weeks ago, uh, one time in the Bible, this literally happened, that believers were thrown into a fiery furnace. And Peter's probably alluding to this. Uh, Daniel 3, King Nebuchadnezzar uh, set up this huge golden image, probably of himself, and everyone has to bow down to it. Everyone has to worship it. Uh, but three young Jewish men, which we now is, know as uh, their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, they refuse. And in a rage, King Nebuchadnezzar, he's thrown into the fiery furnace. As he is so hot that the soldiers throwing them in die from a heat blast. And after they're thrown in, the king looks into the furnace and is amazed. He says this in Daniel 3, 24. Weren't there three men we tied up and threw into the fire? Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Now, what happened in there? The three Jewish men came out unharmed, but only these three came out. What happened to the fourth one? He was the Lord with them in the fire. This was Yeshua. Indeed, we read this in Isaiah 43, verse 1. The Lord says, fear not, I've redeemed you. I've called you by name, you're mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon you. What a divine promise. Now, know carefully what this promise actually is. The promise is not, if you're a believer, you won't go through deep waters. Oh, you won't go through fiery trials. The Lord doesn't say that, does he? In fact, the text in Isaiah doesn't say, if you go through fiery trials. It says, when you go through fiery trials. When you're plunged 
into the fiery furnace. God says, I will be uh, so care for you and love you that you'll be able to sense my love and sense my presence with you. It'll be as if I'm walking with you. And if you sense me walking with you, you won't be consumed by the, that trouble and the trial. It won't turn you hard and, and bitter. It will not break you. But instead, it will refine you. It'll give you splendor. It'll give you character uh, and a soul and a faith. Now, you may ask, well, how do I know this is all true? On the overhead. When in the Hebrew Scriptures, God says, I will be with you in the furnace of affliction, not until you get to the cross of Messiah will you know exactly how far the Lord was willing to go Amen. to make good that promise. When the Lord says in Isaiah 43, I'll be with you in your afflictions, not until you get to the cross do you realize how far he will go, how far he went to be with you in your afflictions. Back in 1 Peter 1, in verses 10 and 11, it talks about the prophets, like Isaiah. So look at 1 Peter 1, verse 10. Uh, uh, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you predicted the sufferings of Messiah and the glories that would follow uh, on the overhead. Only Messianic Judaism, only Messianic faith, of all the religions in the world, says that in Yeshua, God himself became vulnerable and subject to suffering uh, and pain and even death. On the, cross, on the cross, to our astonishment, we see, you know, for example, if you're a political prisoner, that God became the subject of unjust suffering and weakness and death. On the cross, we see Yeshua being lynched, if you will. Or if you've lost a loved one, uh, to our astonishment, we look up on the cross and we see the father losing his only son. Or if you're screaming out in your pain, why God, why is this happening to me? Just look at the cross because there you see Yeshua screaming out in pain. Lord, Lord, why have you forsaken me? Yeshua has suffered everything you've ever suffered and much, much more. Now on one level, a lot of people in history have died equally horrific deaths as Yeshua did. Just look, for example, at the Christian martyrs throughout history as depicted in, in, in the Fox's Book of Martyrs. Or look at the Jewish martyrs throughout history as depicted, for example, in the Book of Maccabees. Now, in the Garden of Gethsemane, you, you see Yeshua as a man on a human level in shock. Blood coming out of his pores. Uh, he's asking the Father, is there, is there any way that this cup of wrath uh, can pass from me? And on the cross, he's crying out, why, why have you forsaken me? Now, why the seeming difference between these other martyrs who went to their deaths throughout history and how Yeshua reacted? The reason is because Yeshua did not just suffer what these other martyrs suffered. On the cross, his sufferings went way beyond the physical. He was experienced cosmically what you and I deserve for our sin and pride and rebellion and self-centeredness. Now, what's the consequence of wanting to be away from someone? If you say to someone, I don't want you around me. Oh, I don't want you controlling my life. I want to be away from you. What's the natural consequence? The natural consequence is for the person to say, okay, fine, be away from me. And because the human race we want to be our own masters. We don't want God to control us. We want to be in charge. The natural consequence is to be cast out of the presence of God. When you're cast out of the presence of God, though, you're losing the very source of all life and of all light. On the cross, Yeshua did not just experience physical torment, but he was being cast out of the presence of God. And he was experiencing Cosmic, absolute, utter, infinite suffering. And Jonathan Edwards, in his famous sermon on Yeshua in the Garden of Gethsemane, he explains this in terms of a fiery furnace. On the overhead, he writes this, The sorrow and distress which Yeshua's soul then suffered arose from that full and immediate view which he then had of the cup of wrath, 
which was vastly more terrible than Nebuchadnezzar's fiery furnace. He had a near view of that furnace, a, a, a furnace of wrath into which he was about to be cast. He was brought to the mouth of that furnace that he might look into it and stand and view its raging flames and see the glowings of its heat that he might know where he was going and what he was about to suffer for us. For us. Do you begin to get a picture of what Yeshua suffered for you? Because it will help you then deal with your own pain and suffering. Go to the cross and say, Lord, why are you allowing this evil and pain and suffering to continue on the overhead? And even though the cross can't tell you uh, what, what the answer is to that question of your own specific pain and suffering, the cross can tell you what the answer is not, what it can't be. It can't be that he doesn't love you. It can't be that he doesn't care. We don't know exactly why the Lord allows any particular evil and suffering. But one thing that it can't be is that he doesn't care or that he's remote or indifferent. Because the Lord came and plunged himself, not just into the fiery furnace of our suffering, but to infinite degrees beyond anything you or I will ever suffer. Because he loves you that much. And he hates suffering that much that he was willing to come and be plunged into our sufferings uh, and experience that, uh, and, and, and that, so that someday he could end all evil without having to end us. Now the implications of this are vast. The cross doesn't tell us what the answer is to our suffering, but it tells us what the answer is not. It's not because he doesn't care. Thank you. Hallelujah. Not at all. Even the, even the existentialist Albert Camus, he understood this on the overhead. Camus writes this. Messiah, the God-man, suffers too. Evil and death can no longer be entirely imputed to him since he suffers and dies. The night on Golgotha was so important because the divinity ostensibly abandoned its traditional privilege and lived through to the end. Despair included the agony of death on the overhead. And because Yeshua went into the fiery furnace for you, this ultimate furnace, the only furnace that could really ever consume you, because he went into the ultimate furnace for you, there's your assurance that he's walking into your personal furnaces with you. No matter how hot it is for you right now, he is walking next to you. So if you want to be able to deal with evil and suffering, the first thing you've got to do is look back to what Yeshua did for you on that tree, on the overhead. Second, second thing you need to do is to avoid pat answers. The pat answers to the question, of why God is God allowing this evil, this suffering to occur? You know, when suffering hits, there's usually two pat ways that people respond. The, uh, and the, here it is in the overhead. Uh, the religious person says, why is God punishing me? What am I doing wrong? Uh, maybe I need to go to shul more often. Uh, maybe I need to pray more. Uh, and there's a lot of believers uh, who feed into this by saying the, these pat things like this. Well, if you're sick, you don't have enough faith. Uh, if, you have, if you're having money problems, you don't have enough faith. So one response is what I call moralism. Uh, if I'm more diligent as a believer, then, uh, then God will bless me. The other approach is not moralism, it's cynicism. Uh, where many religious people tend to see suffering uh, as a punishment. On the other hand, secular people tend to see suffering as just the randomness of life. Life is a crapshoot. They say this proves there is no God. Or if there is a God, he's incompetent uh, or he's indifferent. Uh, and these are these two approaches... Uh, popular approach is moralism and cynicism. Again, moralism says it's all tit for tat. If you lead a good life, you'll have a good life. If you're not having a good life, it must be that you're not living right. And cynicism is based on the idea no one is in charge. Life is random. It's all a matter of, of, of just chance. Uh, there, is, there is no one all-good, all-powerful God in charge of everything. 
Now, now the book of Job is a great example that tells us that both of these approaches are absolutely wrong uh, and spiritual dead ends. Look at Job 1 verse 8. Uh, the Lord says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one like him on all the earth. He's blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And Satan says, oh, you think he's so great? <laughs> Look at Job 1 verse 9. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied, hurt him. Let bad things happen to him. And you'll see he's no good. And God says, okay, you can touch his family and his property, but right now, not him. And so Satan goes out, destroys all his property, kills all his animals, murders all his children. And here we see what I'm calling the asymmetrical relationship between God and suffering. No other philosophy, no other religion has this particular belief. The Lord's asymmetrical relationship uh, to evil and suffering. What do I mean by this? First, notice that attacking Job is Satan's idea. It's not God's. And it's Satan, not God, who actually goes out and does it. God does not directly, actively generate the suffering. Satan does it. Uh, and this is reminding us that when God made this world, he didn't make disease in it. He didn't make natural disasters. That's not the world that God made. It wasn't a world in which windstorms come and knock over houses and kill all of Job's children. It was not a place of death. Disease and disaster and death are not things that God made. They're in this world, but they're the product of the fall. The, 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 they're, they're, they're forces of darkness that were unleashed when we turned away from the Lord. When we rebelled against God, the fabric of this world began to unravel. And we unleashed these forces. So God is neither desiring nor deliberately, intentionally creating uh, the suffering. The suffering that's now going into Job's life. Satan's doing it. But God is allowing it. Yes, if he's allowing it, because he's in absolute control. And ultimately, he's overruling the devil. God permits it, but then he limits it. He says, Satan, you can do this, but you can't do this. So why does God allow it? Well, the book of Job illustrates that God allows Satan to accomplish the very opposite of what he wants to accomplish. You know, he only gives Satan enough rope to hang himself. Satan is bringing evil and suffering into Job's life, but why? Why is Satan doing this? What result does Satan want? He wants Job discredited. He wants to expose him as a fraud. He wants Job to curse God and die. And to prove that Job only served God as long as God blessed him. That's what Satan's trying to prove. But if you've read the book of Job, you know that doesn't happen. Satan loses his wager with God. And that's why the book of Job has come down to us, even to this day, to encourage us to keep the faith, even when things do not go well. Even in the face of evil and disappointment and suffering, we praise the Lord regardless. The Lord only permits Satan to bring evil into Job's life in such a way and in such an amount that in the end, it completely defeats Satan's real intention. Satan is only allowed by God to defeat himself and to achieve the very opposite of what he wanted. And this is telling us that this is the way God works with us as well. He hates suffering and evil, but he is ultimately in control. Romans 8, 28, and the overhead. God works all things for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. The relationship between the Lord and suffering is what I'm calling asymmetrical. God's in control, he's permitting it, but that doesn't mean he likes when people suffer. No, he hates it, but he permits it. Why? He permits evil and suffering to come into our life only to the degree that it defeats the evil intention of Satan for your life. Only to the degree that it makes you ultimately into a great person if you respond correctly. Only to the degree that it ends up in the end defeating evil itself. But note this, very important. Job never finds out about any of this, does he? He has no idea of this conversation between God and Satan, or that Satan challenged Job's motives, 
or that God permitted Satan uh, to attack Job to prove Satan wrong. God never tells Job any of this. Now, the moralist says, you're suffering because you're not living right. You need more faith. And the cynic says, oh, the reason you're suffering is because life is a crapshoot. Oh, there is no God. Or he's not in control. Or oh, he doesn't care about you. But these are just pat answers. How do they know why you're suffering? They don't know. Uh, and these are answers that keep them in control. Uh, the cynic says, life is so bad, God's allowing all this evil and suffering for no reason, so go ahead and live any way you like. You don't owe God anything. Uh, and the moralist says, you just need to do this and this and this, and then, then God will bless you. You've got to follow the formula. But the Bible says both of these are pat answers. Both are trying to explain in neat little packages why you're going through evil and suffering. And they're giving you the type of answers that keep them in control on the overhead. But what the Bible calls you to do is to serve the Lord, even though you will never know, just like Job never knew, the actual reasons for your pain and your suffering. You will not know in this life, but the Lord calls you to serve him in the midst of it and to stay in a relationship with the, with the God whom you can't control. So on the overhead, number one, look to the past, the cross. Number two, avoid pat answers. Number three, embrace the fact that you will not know in this life why you suffer. In fact, you need not to know. It's important that you don't know. In the book of Job, God says, Job loves me. He, he serves me because he loves me. And Satan says, no, he doesn't. He doesn't love you. He only loves the things he's getting from you. It's the things that he loves. It's the money. It's the prosperity. It's the health. Uh, it's the status. Job doesn't love you, God. He loves the things he's getting from you. And therefore, if you take away all these things, he'll curse you and reject you. Now, let's give the devil his due here. Because he's put his finger smack on one of the biggest problems of the whole human race. For example, you're at work or in social circles, and have you ever had someone come up to you and be real friendly to you, but once they find out you can't or you won't uh, do for them what they want you to do uh, to advance their career, uh, to get them into a club, uh, to help them network, uh, help them meet people, if you, you, you can't do that, they all of a sudden drop you like a hot potato. Why? Because they weren't liking you for you. They were only liking you for what you could do for them. Or maybe uh, if you're a woman uh, and a guy starts to take an interest in you, uh, but he finds out you won't sleep with him, he's gone. He ghosts you. Why? Because he didn't love you for you. Uh, he loved you for what he could get. And Satan is smiling because he claims that's how we love God. Only for what we can get from him. Satan says, we don't love God just for who he is, but for the worldly blessings that we get. And by the way, if you go to a modern day prosperity gospel church, they're proving him right. <laughs> That's exactly what they preach. And the only way you're going to learn to love God for who he is, in and of himself, is through suffering. The only way to become a true spiritual giant is to suffer and not know why. People say, you know, I could handle the suffering if I only knew why. I could handle the suffering if God were to say to me, you're suffering now, but five years from now, all these good things are going to happen to you. And 10 years from now, you're gonna, all these good things are going to happen. Then, then I'd be able to handle it. In other words, you'd be serving God for the things you get on the overhead. The only way to be sure you're serving God for he himself alone, rather than from what you're, you're getting out of it, is if you've got to be in a condition where serving God gives you nothing, where you're getting nothing out of it. In fact, you're getting the opposite. Bad things are happening to you because you're serving God. Persecution, tribulation, you're getting nothing out of serving him. 
And that's why you can't know the reason for your suffering. Uh, there can't be an answer to the, to the question why uh, that's given to you. Or else you'll never become the kind of a spiritually mature person that suffering can make you. If you want to learn to love God for himself alone and to prove Satan wrong, you, you've got to be willing to let God put you through the ringer. So number one, in facing problems of evil and suffering, uh, look back to the cross. Number two, avoid pat answers. Number three, embrace not knowing why you're suffering. Because that's the only way you're going to learn to love the Lord, even in the midst of your suffering. You know, Satan is cynical about love. God says to Satan, have you seen my servant Job? He loves me. And in essence, Satan says, like the old song, what's love got to do with it, got to do with it? <laughs> Satan is the ultimate cynic. He says, you don't love God. You're just using him. And you don't love one another. You're just using one another. And God says, no, I can create free lovers who truly love from their heart because I can recreate them through the blood of my son, Yeshua, into new creations. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In C.S. Lewis's famous screw tape letters, the devils, the devils are always saying to each other, there's no such thing as love. But they know their enemy, Yeshua, allows his disciples to undergo suffering because he wants to turn them into free lovers, loving out of their freedom of their will. And that's the only way to become a free lover, someone who loves God for who he is himself alone and not for what you're getting out of him. And then finally, on the overhead here, number four, you must rest in the proof of God's love. Because you're being called to stay in a relationship with, with a God whom you can't control. And to accept and embrace the mystery of not knowing why you're suffering. So how do you walk this path? You know, Job starts out pretty well. He says, uh, in the face of tremendous loss, he says this in Job 121. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I'll depart. The Lord has given, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And here we see emotional realism. The text says, Job, what did he do? He tore his robes. He fell on the ground. He cried out. And then the text says this, Job 1.22. And all these things Job sinned not. You know, most of us, most believers today, you know, when we see someone acting like this, you know, someone tearing their clothes, falling to the ground, screaming out, we say, They've kind of lost it, haven't they? <laughs> but the Bible says, in all these things, Job sinned not. Yeshua faith is not stoicism. But note that in his emotional pain and his authenticity, and his being totally in touch and free in his expression of his emotions, Job holds on to his core theology of grace. Because he doesn't say to God, these things you've taken from me, they're mine. I earned them. Uh, I worked for them. They're my precious. <laughs> uh, uh, these homes, these children, <laughs> this, these, this livestock, this money, these things are mine. How dare you take them away? No. What does Job say? I came naked, and naked means vulnerable, helpless, and I'm leaving naked. And everything I had was on loan from you. Lord, you gave them to me as a free gift, a gift of grace. Now, why is it so cynical? I'm sorry. Why is it so crucial for us, or crucial for you to grab hold of this theology of grace in the midst of your suffering? Why do you must do this? Because if you build your life on things... If you say, this is what makes me whole, this is what makes me who I am, uh, that I've worked really, really hard, now I've got this money, I've got this position, uh, I've got this name, uh, this achievement, if this is the uttermost foundation of your heart, then your happiness are your things. And then suffering will pull you away from the uttermost foundation of your happiness. Because that's what suffering is. Suffering is taking away something important to you, some, some earthly thing. On the overhead. 
And so if you build your life on these things, suffering will make you sadder and sadder, and madder and madder, and worse and worse. But if you build your life on God, although you certainly like having money and health and friends and and loved ones, if you build your life on God, the ultimate love for you will be God's love. The ultimate wealth will be God's love. The ultimate status will be God's love. That's why Peter writes this, 1 Peter 1, verse 8. Though you've not seen him, you love him. And even though you don't see him now, you believe in him. And you're filled with joy unspeakable and full of glory. And then what suffering's doing, it's actually driving you deeper into your very source of joy. On the overhead, if you build your life on things, suffering pulls you away from your source of joy. And you'll get mad, as I said, madder and madder, and sadder and sadder, and worse and worse. But if you build your life on the Lord, then what happens is that suffering drives you deeper into him. It drives you deeper into your source of joy. Now, when Job got a hold of God's grace, back then, being the oldest book in the Bible, he didn't have a whole lot to go on. Uh, All he knew was that his good fortunes and his blessings came from God. Uh, and that I should look to him, that look to these things as a loan from him. And if the Lord wants to remove them, well, he brought them to me to start with, so he has the right to, to take them away. But Job didn't have the resources to understand grace the way that you and I do today. You know, Satan comes to God and says, Job really doesn't love you. He's just using you. And Satan pulled this very same trick before. Do you know where? The Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, Satan comes to us and says, God doesn't really love you. You see, Adam and you see, Adam and Eve said, We're not allowed to touch or to eat from us, or to eat from this tree, because God said so and he loves us. Uh, and what does Satan say? You must be kidding. <laughs> What's love got to do with it? Got to do with it. <laughs> He's using you. That tree's perfectly good to eat. He's just trying to use you. He's trying to keep you down. He's trying to exploit you on the overhead. Now, when Satan said bad things to God about us, there was some truth to them, but God didn't accept it. But when Satan said bad things to us about God and there was no truth to it, we believed it. The lie of Satan is that if you give yourself to God unconditionally, utterly, wholly, if if you totally trust him, he'll crush you. You won't be happy. You can't trust God. God doesn't really love you. That's the lie of Satan. And it sunk into the hearts of our parents, Adam and Eve. And it sunk into the heart of every human being. And you know why you can't handle bad news? You know why when suffering comes, you immediately think the worst of God? It's because You really don't believe that God loves you. And you may say, what do you mean, Rabbi David? Of course I do. I'm a believer. Of course I know God loves me. Yes, you know it intellectually. You know it to affirm it in a statement of faith. But many of you don't know in your heart of hearts the Lord of the universe loves you unstoppably, infallibly, unconditionally. And so deep down inside, when someone criticizes you, or when bad things happen to you, or it doesn't look like you're succeeding, or when disappointments come into your life, you get really upset. Why? You say, well, well, yes, I, I guess I know, yeah, God loves me. But that's kind of on audio. But when people think about me, that's on video. <laughs> what God thinks of me seems kind of abstract. But what people think about me and how things are going down here, that's of utmost importance. Yes, I know God loves me, but what's the most important thing to me is that I need my things. That's our attitude. Uh, We need our status. You need your achievement. You need your friends. You need your fans. You need your success uh, and acclaim uh, and affirmation on the overhead. The reason why many of us can't handle suffering is because we believe the lie of Satan. 
Satan said to God about us, they don't really love you. And God resisted. But when Satan said to us about God, he doesn't love you, we believed the lie. And so the biggest thing we need is proof that God loves us. The number one thing we need to handle life is proof that God really loves us. And the thing we need to walk down this path of suffering without knowing the reasons why, so that we can use it then to become people of greatness, is proof that God loves me. So how can you know that? Here's how. Centuries after Job, Satan assaulted another innocent sufferer who also died naked and who cried out, why, why am I suffering? And like Job, he got no answer. It was Yeshua. Now when Job suffered, he was only relatively innocent. But Yeshua was the true Job, the absolutely innocent sufferer. And when Job felt he was abandoned by God, he really wasn't on the overhead. But Yeshua was truly abandoned by God. In fact, Yeshua was the only person in history that God said to, if you obey me fully, I'll crush you to powder and send you to hell. I'll turn my back on you. And you'll experience absolute separation from my glory and the face of the Father. If you obey me fully, I will send you to hell. And the overhead. God never said that to any other person, only to Yeshua. Yeshua is the only person who ever served God truly for nothing. And why did he do it? For you, and for you, and for me, for us. And that's your proof of how much God loves you. This is what you need to be able to go through suffering and come out as refined by fire. See Yeshua as the innocent sufferer who died on the cross for you. And this proves two things. Number one, it proves Satan is a liar. And number two, it proves that God loves you infinitely. The cross proves that God uh, came in human form and was willing to love you just for who you are in yourself, warts and all. He didn't get anything out of it. He already had all the glory. He already had all the angels worshiping him. Why did he love you that much that to come to earth? Uh, why did he leave all this to come to earth? Why? Because he loved you just for who you are in and of yourself. So now you go and love him just for who he is in and of himself and the overhead. Yeshua suffered, not so that you wouldn't suffer, but that when you suffer, you can become like him. Amen. Let's stand and pray. The music team to come on up. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for giving us today this good word on evil and suffering. Uh, a terrible word, but a good word. And that is, that there is a purpose when bad things happen to me. Uh, we know that you, Lord, you hate evil and suffering. Uh, you hate it so much, you are willing to get involved in it and to become an innocent sufferer yourself. And as a result, when, when we suffer, even, then, even though we may have done nothing to, to bring it on ourselves, we can know that you care, uh, that you love us. Uh, and the proof of your love is the cross, the tree, what you did for us. So we can now walk the path uh, uh, of obedience and faithfulness to you without knowing why we're suffering. And yet at the same time to trust you and to know you that you love us because of what Yeshua did for me. So we know that you're working all things together for good for, to those who love you, to those who are called according to your purpose. The, that you're using our suffering to refine our faith, uh, to refine our souls, so that we can come out looking like gold. Yeshua, you suffered, not so that we wouldn't suffer, but that when we suffer, we can become like you. Build this into our life as we base our life on you. We pray this in your name, Yeshua. Amen. Shabbat shalom.